I think Scotland will become independent. My view is that that is the direction of travel. But on the question of timing, for the last 12 months, I've been saying very clearly that I don't think it's right to consider that decision while things are so unclear and uncertain around Brexit. So as First Minister, I won't give consideration to the timing until we've got some Brexit clarity. The message I was given to my party at our conference yesterday is that that gives us an opportunity not to worry all the time about when we might vote again on independence, but instead to engage in the substance of the arguments and to address people in Scotland who still ask why we should be independent. And I think that debate is timely because there's going to be change. Brexit makes that inevitable. Most people think Brexit will make the country poorer. So this is an opportunity to look at whether there's a better alternative for Scotland and focus on hope and optimism and how we maximise our potential as a country. So that's the opportunity I was encouraging my party to grasp when I spoke to them yesterday. So pretty clear then that you say that there needs to be a bit more Brexit clarity until we get more clarity uh, about a referendum uh, on Scotland. So let's talk about Brexit, shall we? Because in 2016, after that referendum, you said that you were looking at ways to keep Scotland in the single market, even if the UK leaves. So how is that going? Well, we are exploring all options to protect Scotland's interests. I also said in 2016, and I still say this today, that the best option for the whole of the UK, if it's leaving the EU, which I regret, is to stay in the single market and the customs union. And I happen to think that there is still a real prospect of securing that. It might not feel like that just now when the Prime Minister is always ruling it out, but we only have to look at well, uh, the divided cabinet. I, I do, yes, and we'll see how the votes go in the House of Commons this week. But even beyond that, I, I do think that is still a reasonable prospect because the Prime Minister's position is, I think, just undeliverable and unsustainable. She's trying to reconcile all sorts of things that are irreconcilable. And the common sense solution, as well as, I guess, the best democratic compromise, uh, given the divisions of opinion around Brexit, is to stay in the single market and the customs union. So I don't think there is any reason to give up on that argument right now. Well, that seems remarkably optimistic, given that both the Conservative Party and Labour are saying uh, that they are not looking for single market membership. Do you think that something could be on the cards, like what is happening uh, with the Irish situation? Um, the EU has said that they're looking into a bespoke uh, agreement uh, to solve the problem of the border in Northern Ireland. Is that something that you could envisage happening for Scotland, a bespoke solution? Well, one, one of the reasons why I don't think we should give up on customs union and single market membership is that that is the simplest way to resolve the issues in Northern Ireland and resolve the issues around the border uh, between the North and the Republic of Ireland. So, you know, that's one I, of the main that reasons that's to your keep arguing ideal that. But, scenario, but I'm just trying to get to you know, the reality of the situation. Could you be arguing well, for something bespoke for Scotland? Well, if there is a bespoke arrangement for Northern Ireland, and again, I've said this all along, that keeps the, uh, Northern Ireland in or effectively in the single market, then I do think it becomes all the more important that those options are open to Scotland. Because if we find ourselves outside the single market, which would uh, be damaging in a whole host of ways anyway, but Northern Ireland is still in, then Scotland would find itself economically at a competitive disadvantage. And that would have implications for jobs and investment in Scotland. So I think it stands to reason that as First Minister I would be arguing for similar options for Scotland. But I come back to my original point. I think it's right for the whole of the UK to remain in the single market and the customs union. Jobs depend on that, investment depend on that, living standards depend on that. And I don't think we should simply accept uh, the meltdown that is coming, to use the Foreign Secretary's language, if the Prime Minister and the government continue to argue a position that is not deliverable. You know, Theresa May is spending all of her time trying to keep her cabinet together, talking about options that unite them. I'm not sure whether she's going to succeed even in that, but the options they're talking about have already effectively been ruled out by the EU. We need to see some realism emerge in these discussions, and that's why I do think uh, we've seen Labour shift, uh, I think, on the customs union. I think we may see them shift more on single market membership. I, I think this is a moment for those of us who believe in these outcomes to continue to argue the case for them. You're very critical there about uh, Theresa May's uh, stance. Do you ever look at the other people around the cabinet table and feel a degree of relief that it's her doing the negotiations rather than, for example, Boris Johnson or David Davis? 
Well, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think Boris Johnson should be anywhere near a, a government office. You know, he must be uh, one of the least fit people to hold a high office of state that we've ever seen. Uh, and I thought that before his comments at the end of last week. He's entirely playing to a hard Brexiteer gallery. It sounds as if Boris Johnson, in fact, it sounds as if uh, none of the members of the Tory cabinet actually care about jobs and living standards uh, and prospects for people the length and breadth of the UK. And, and that's got to change. And if the Cabinet, the Prime Minister, are not prepared to change and argue for a, a more realistic and sensible position, then I hope we see the House of Commons force them into that position. Now, we'll wait and see what happens this week. I'm not saying I'm, I'm holding my breath or being overly optimistic, but sooner or later, there has to be an outbreak of common sense. And uh, I hope we see that sooner rather than later. Um, talking about uh, those comments that Boris Johnson made, uh, one of them was that Donald Trump might make a better job of the Brexit negotiations. He, of course, has been ripping up every uh, piece of diplomatic protocol uh, at the G7. Will you be welcoming him to Scotland when he comes to visit? Well, we don't know his plans yet. Uh, you know, I, I think everybody knows that I don't see eye to eye with Donald Trump on very many things. Of course, if the President of the United States comes to Scotland and uh, there's an opportunity to engage with him as First Minister, of course, I will do that. But, you know, I'll make very clear the values and principles that are important to me, to my government, I think to many people across Scotland. And I think in this uh, uncertain world we live in right now, it's important to speak up for those progressive principles, uh, those values of social democracy. And I think the more politicians we hear doing that, the better. Uh, now, before you go, I've got to ask you, uh, the World Cup is uh, starting <laughs> next week. Unfortunately, Scotland are not playing a part in it. So are you going to be cheering on England? I wish England well in the World Cup. Uh, maybe if they win this World Cup, we can stop talking about 1966 at long last. <laughs> but as I was saying in another interview at the end of the week, I drew Iceland in my office sweepstakes. So I'll be keeping an eye out on their scores as well. <laughs> OK, uh, very <laughs> diplomatically answered. Uh, Nicola Sturgeon, thanks very much.